Tonight, a Democratic congressman who served in top positions in both President Obama and President Clinton's national security teams. He'll join RFL, Tom Malinowski of New Jersey. He'll take a look at how the president's upended decades of U.S. foreign policy. We'll also discuss what's going on at the border in those migrant detention facilities. Then, over the years, we have covered too many corruption cases to count. Republicans, Democrats, it doesn't matter. We've seen a whole lot of politicians get it fitted for armed jumpsuits, but it could get a whole lot harder to convict people who have violated our public trust. Tonight, we'll explain why. Also, Joe Biden, given his first extended interview since the debates and his poll numbers are in a nosedive. The former vice president, he's now battling to keep his lead to hold off the progressive wing of the party. Tonight, we look at the challenges facing Biden and how the other candidates are trying to take advantage of his struggles. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Well, all week, we've been talking about the terrible conditions at some of the facilities near the border, those facilities holding migrants who crossed over into our country along the Mexican border. As you probably know by now, the majority of these people, they are fleeing violence and extreme poverty in countries like Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. We've also been showing you images that have just been released, showing conditions inside some of these facilities in Texas. These photos are part of a Homeland Security report that details how these people are being treated. That report, it talks about severe overcrowding, people in filthy clothes and conditions, no laundry facilities, temperatures exceeding 80 degrees in the cells, only a few showers for several hundred people, no hot meals for several days, and it goes on and on. For his part, President Trump, when asked about these conditions, well, he said this before he left today, spend the weekend playing golf at his club in Bedminster, New Jersey. Here's his answer. I think they do a great job with those facilities, but you know how it could be taken care of? Number one, tell them not to come because it's illegal. Very unfair to people that have been waiting online for seven or eight years and they're about to be admitted and they've studied and they know the country and the history and everything. And then a person comes in, walks in, and all of a sudden, they become a citizen or they're allowed to stay. So thousands and thousands of people will be legally removed from the country, and that process has started. By the way, not illegal to apply for asylum in this country. No, those people who cross the border are not granted legal citizenship in any way, shape, or form. The Border Patrol, they are also in full damage control mode. Now, the head of the Tucson sector just posted the following video on Twitter. Bear in mind, this is Arizona, not Texas. My goal today is to dispel some of the misinformation that's out there in regards to our detention facilities. So come with me. This is a supply room that is typical in every one of the stations in Tucson sector. What we have supplies of are diapers, baby wipes, clothing for children marked by gender, age, clothing for men and women. I don't know what he was trying to do there, except it doesn't remotely resemble what is going on in many other facilities. We've shown you some of the photos. In fact, our own government, the Trump administration, released images that are on your screen as we see right now. There's also new fallout from the president's Salute to America event held yesterday and his foreign trip that preceded it last week, where he cozied up to dictators and despots and took on some of our own allies. Well, joining me now to discuss all of that and more is Democratic New Jersey Congressman Tom Malinowski. The congressman served on the Foreign Affairs Committee, serves there now, I should say, and he was also previously on President Clinton's National Security Council and also the Assistant Secretary of State in the Obama administration. First of all, thank you for the time, and, and let's start a little closer to home. Uh, everybody seems to have an opinion on what they saw yesterday from the Lincoln Memorial with the President's Salute to America. What was your reaction um, to what you saw and what you heard? Well, I was, uh, I, I didn't watch it. I was busy going to real July 4th celebrations here in New Jersey, uh, celebrations with kids and fireworks and face paint and patriotism and community spirit and no misuse of the military to glorify our government. Uh, or our leader. This is not what we do in the United States. It's what happens in, in communist countries. It happened in the Soviet Union, and, and it's sort of sad to see it uh, playing out uh, on our national mall. Uh, I will say I'm very, very proud of our military leaders who uh, quietly resisted this uh, for weeks. Uh, most of them 
found excuses to be absent uh, when the president commanded them to be on the stage uh, with him. Uh, he wanted a parade with tanks and artillery and missiles, and all he got was uh, a couple of, uh, of pieces that were in a roped-off VIP area for Republican donors that nobody really saw. So kudos to the military for, uh, for asserting its independence from political interference. A huge issue uh, last week, and obviously um, long before that, uh, has been uh, the immigration uh, situation we have, specifically the humanitarian crisis along the border. The president tweeted something post the revelation of not just uh, firsthand uh, accounts, but also some of the pictures and video we've seen at these um, obviously overcrowded detention facilities. The president said, and I'm reading his tweets verbatim here, if illegal immigrants are unhappy with the conditions, just tell them not to come, all problems solved, exclamation point. Uh, if you really want to fix the crisis, uh, tell migrants not to come into our country unless they're willing to do so legally, hopefully through a system based on merit. This way we have no problems at all. And again, with a big punctuation point. When you heard the president say that, particularly after what has come out in the last few days, what was your reaction? My reaction is that he's being very honest. He's acknowledging that the cruelty of taking kids from their parents, denying them basic uh, hygiene and food and warmth is deliberate, that it's deliberate cruelty trying to deter people from seeking asylum in, in our country. And, you know, that's not who we are. We're, we're not a cruel country. We, we, we welcome people who, um, who come here from all around the world, who want to work hard to try to make America great. And the other takeaway is the cruelty does not work because people are still coming despite what they are facing on the way to America, despite the suffering they're experiencing at the border, they are still coming. The humanitarian crisis is still there. So, you know, I say let's treat people decently. Um, let's treat people the way Americans have always treated people. And then let's try to work on the reasons why people are coming and work with the Central American countries to deal with the violence and the poverty that is driving people to take this very risky journey to America. I mentioned off the top your foreign policy chops, not just your committee um, position, but before that in, in prior administrations. The audience obviously saw what happened in the recent trip the president took uh, to the Far East, where I think by any standard, um, there was a coddling of dictators and enemies to U.S. interests and a marginalizing, if not worse, of our allies or alliances. For a guy who spent a lot of his adult life in this world, can you put in context, as I've tried to, how in two and a half years, the world order has been upended. I don't believe in our national interest, but things have changed radically in terms of our position and also our role, really, going forward in terms of the leader of the free world. Well, you can't be the leader of the free world if you turn your back on America's allies. He's turning his back on the free world and begging for the, the support and, and affection of our enemies, of dictators like Kim Jong-un and, and Putin. Uh, it's almost as if our foreign policy just comes down to who can flatter the President of the United States the most. And, you, you know, that, that clearly creates an advantage uh, for, for our adversaries who are seeing this weakness on the part of, of the President. Look, it's, it, it, foreign policy can be complicated, but one of the most simple principles is that America is strongest when we are working with our allies in Europe, in Asia, countries that share our democratic values and are willing to fight with us and work with us to build a world in which Americans can be safe. We cannot turn our backs on that. That is the key to success for America in the world. Joe Biden, um, former vice president, did an interview with CNN where, among other things, he said he's concerned about the leftward tilt uh, of the party. Uh, some of the raised hands on the debate stage uh, to get rid of uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, uh, go to Medicare for all, um, to have uh, basically no criminal, uh, basically legalize illegal immigration completely, uh, health care 
um, for anyone uh, even of non-legal status in the country, et cetera. You're one of the few lawmakers nowadays with all these gerrymandered districts who actually is in the swing district. Uh, you took over from a Republican. Is the vice president right that some of the positions, at least of the candidates and of some of the left wing of the Democratic Party, um, aren't going to fly uh, in those districts or in parts of this country that are in the middle? Yeah, I do believe he's right. Uh, but I also look at what we are doing in the House of Representatives. Look, Americans elected a Democratic House, and they did it in districts like mine, in districts that are evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats. And look at what we're doing in the House of Representatives. We're trying to fix the Affordable Care Act. We're not trying to replace it with some radical new scheme. Um, we're, we're not trying to open the borders. We're, we're, we're funding border security, but also more humane treatment of migrants, which is, I think, where the vast majority of Americans are. Uh, we're trying to protect the environment. We're, we're, we're not passing the Green New Deal or something um, vastly ambitious that we don't yet understand. Um, so the Democrats that the American people elected to govern in the House are working in a very pragmatic, very bipartisan way to try to solve this country's problems. I think that is the heart and soul of the Democratic Party today. Let me ask you about an issue um, obviously significant to not only your district but our region, the Gateway Project. Is there, do you see a path that this is going to happen? We all talk about the, the clear need of it, but given how polarizing things are in Washington, will this actually happen with real federal dollars really coming uh, to help this project get going? I believe Gateway will happen, and I am fighting my heart out to make sure that it does. We just passed a funding bill for the Department of Transportation that funds the first stage of the Gateway Tunnel project. And in the House, we attached a, uh, a condition to it. We, we said that if uh, the Secretary Chow, the Secretary of Transportation, doesn't spend the money that we've given her on Gateway, then she cannot hire any more political appointees to her department. We are serious about this, and we have bipartisan support in the House to make sure that this happens. Uh, and eventually, I think, you know, we, we will find agreement with the Senate. It, it, a little known fact, the, the second biggest, most expensive transportation project in America is a bridge in Kentucky, in Senator McConnell's state. He wants to build that bridge. We need to build our tunnel. There's a basis there for a deal that I don't think Donald Trump will be able to do anything about. Finally, uh, in 12 days, uh, Robert Mueller will be on the Hill, and um, in live and living color, the public will get to hear answers. I, I've spoken to a lot of your colleagues to say anyone expecting anything uh, revelatory here um, will be disappointed. But nonetheless, safe to say, 90-some-odd percent of this country, and I would guess a majority of your colleagues, have actually not read the Mueller report. Do you think that eyes will be open simply because they'll be hearing for the first time what's already on paper? Or do you think people setting themselves up uh, hoping for something really dispositive or that will move the needle will be disappointed at the end of the day? Because you yourself, I think, have evolved to the position where you think an impeachment inquiry is warranted. Yeah, well, because I read the Mueller report, and, and I think there's enough there and enough that's happened since that should make anybody who's concerned about defending the law in America very, very concerned. Um, but look, most Americans, understandably, have not read a 400-page report. Um, we want to we wanna see the movie, not read the book. And I think what this hearing will provide is a, a very condensed, very vivid description in the words of a man who is respected by the vast majority of Americans uh, of what happened in the 2016 campaign and what the president did to try to shut down an investigation by the Justice Department of a foreign powers attack on America. And I think Americans, many of, many of us will see this for the first time and, 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 get, uh, and get this condensed picture of it. So, um, let's wait and see what happens. I don't expect to learn anything new myself, but I think many, many Americans um, will, for the first time, uh, see the full picture of what Mr. Mueller presented to us. Congressman Melanowski, I appreciate a few minutes today. Thank you so much. Of course, anytime. Thank you. Happy Fourth.
All right, when we come back, if you watch RFL, you know that we cover a whole lot of corruption cases. Some of the politicians who are indicted, they walk away scot-free. Others, they look into prison time. But things have already been stacked against prosecutors thanks to a recent Supreme Court ruling that kind of flew under the radar. This could make it even harder to put crooked politicians away. And you can thank a recent development in Bridgegate, believe it or not, for that. When we come back, me and the guys will explain.